was just waiting on, sorry, it started, started a little bit late. All right. <clears throat> so by this point, um, we should have a um, reference or um, file ready. I think most of y'all are, are here. Uh, I'm, maybe a couple are, are a little bit behind, but that's okay. Um, we, we don't necessarily need these files until Monday. But nonetheless, we have this, this reference ORF. Sorry, I'm just kind of moving around. Right, from our blast output, um, we went ahead and added our annotations to our um, transcripts. Now, I, I have moved my transcript file around, right? It was originally here. Um, but I moved it to another directory just to keep things clean, right? Just to keep my directory clean because um, some of the next steps, uh, the directories can get a little bit messy, you know, just a little bit. Um, and so once, once we have a reference and now we have uh, our libraries, like our clean RNA-seq libraries, um, what we're going to do is find out where all of those reads came from and estimate expression for each gene. Um, so I'm going to pull up a, a program. It's called IGV, or, or uh, it's made by the Broad. I'm not going to make you all use this. It's just an example so you can visualize what's about to happen. Um, it is a little graphy, so it may lag. If it lags, I'll, I'll kind of stop and just whatever, move forward. Um, but that's this is IGV. And so what we're looking at is a transcript, right? So we have this entire transcript across the top. Um, and so this is for a specific gene. Now I've mapped these reads to a reference um, created by Ensemble. So this is a human CDS reference sequence, right? This isn't one that we made, but I'm just using it as an example. Right, and so we have this specific gene, this ensemble gene, um, CCDC134. Okay, and so this is the entire span of the gene, it is approximately 600 bases, maybe 700 bases. And each of these gray bars represents a read from our RNA seq library. And so what we're looking at is where every single read that built, that came from this gene mapped to, and this this gray histogram kind of on top is is a coverage plot, right? Where where the most reads map to in this from this gene. Um, and so I have a couple of reads highlighted. I have a couple of paired in reads highlighted. Um, the red are one paired in read from a specific transcript or for, from a specific RNA molecule, and the blue ones are from a different one, right? So these are all different sequencing reads. They're mapped paired in. It's just, again, it's just easy for you to see um, what mapping does, right? So all of these are FASTQ reads that we got off the aluminum machine, and we're just mapping them to different genes. And so the great thing about RNA-seq is that the read count is going to be proportional to the abundance of RNA for each gene. Um, and and it's very it's verifiable. So we have compared you know RNA seq analyses to qPCR that's a little more sensitive, a little bit more accurate. Um, and they're really, really close. Um, further, RNA seq is repeatable. So usually if you get the same tissue um, from the same individual and you do an RNA seq you're going to roughly get the same read count for each gene. At least everything will be within an order of magnitude of each other, more often than not. Um, and so, again, this specific gene, this CCDC134 gene, 
has a lot of reads that map to it. Um, and so what, th this one has a lot. But if we look at another, um, let's just say, yeah, this TR, this TRBV71, much fewer reads map to that gene. Fewer reads are derived from this gene. It's a little bit shorter, but we're only looking at two paired in reads in this library uh, or, or from, for, from this gene. And so I think I can do a quick uh, uh, show mate. Come on, go to mate, right? So there's that mate. Um, and we can see the other mate, go to mate, and that, that pair. Right, pretty neat. Um, so this gene, you could say, is less expressed than um, the CCDC gene that we previously looked at. Right, few weeds versus dozens of reads. Um, so the other gene is more expressed. Now we have effectively estimate gene expression by counting the number of reads that map to each transcript. Um, now there is some wiggle room around that. There, there is some differences in that um, because it's not uncommon for a single read to map to two or more genes, um, especially like pair logs, right? Relatively closely related pair logs may exhibit similar expression because the same reads will map to both genes. Um, and I think if we zoom in a little bit, we can, I can't, I can't zoom any more than that, but we can actually see the bases down here at the bottom. Um, and yeah, all, all that's really, I guess that's not really important. It's just it, the recount is more important than anything else. And so, so today's uh, tutorial is more or less kind of my, my way of mapping reads um, to a reference. Now there's a number of different ways we can go about this problem. Um, one, we can map to genome. So if we do have a reference genome, um, it's probably most kosher to map reads to a genome and then use your like a transcript GTF or GFF to know the boundaries of each gene, each transcript, each, each exon and estimate expression that way. Um, I think that's a little bit more consistent and a little more accurate because uh, you're not just referent, you're not just mapping genes to one, just a set of genes, you're mapping gene reads to the entire genome. And so you can estimate expression from a lot of different things that way. Regardless, um, the alternative is to do what we're about to do is map reads to a reference CDS library. Um, furthermore, even that can be broken down, either mapping to a reference from like, like a known reference, for example, an ensemble based CDS library or transcriptome assembly that you've made yourself. So if you are working on a non-mammal, non-model organism, there are no references, you're effectively limited to um, doing an RNA-seq, assembling your reads, um, annotating your reads, and mapping back to that reference. And so we're, again, we're kind of assuming that we don't have a reference, so this is what we're going to do. Um, and not only are there two major strategies, genome mapping or CDS mapping, uh, but there's already like a dozen and a half programs that will um, do it. And they all kind of ha handle multi-mapping reads a little bit differently. I think that's, that's kind of a major difference between programs is how they handle reads that can map to more than one, one gene or more than one locus. Um, I, you know, the programs get tested, whatever. But honestly, when it comes down to it, you know, kind of just pick your favorite and be consistent. Um, and so my go-to software for mapping reads to calculate expression is going to derive from an RSEM package. So R-S-E-M, RSEM. 
Um, and so this is about a little more than a decade, maybe a decade old, maybe a little less. Um, but it's going to do t it's going to do two things for us. Um, it's going to use a third party mapper to map our reads, and then RSIM is effectively a, a, a population of scripts that will count the reads, right? That will yeah, count the number of reads that map to each gene. Right, this is, again, this is my go-to. Um, I, think, I think it's just easier. But even further, like the mapper um, can be uh, star is a possible mapper, uh, BWA is a common mapper, but RSIM by default will use an older mapper called Bowtie. And I, I it's, it's fine. You know, I, I, I don't seem to run across any problems um, using kind of the default parameters of RSIM. Uh, I think BWA is a better mapper um, but RSIM kind of supplies the, inherently supplies the parameters of bow tie. Um, so you don't necessarily have to worry about it. So, so RSIM is kind of optimized for specific bow tie parameters. Um, so I just leave it at that. But nonetheless, whenever we run RSIM, we have, we have to break it down into two, two different steps. One, we have to index our reference. So if we just try to map reads to the reference CDSs or, or sequences that we have, um, it, it won't work. We have to, we have to create indices um, or additional files. So we haven't done this yet. Honestly, you have to do the same thing before you run a blast, right? So if I, if I LS the, the Swiss prot database, um, right, we see the Uniprot FASTA file, but then there are these additional files, um, the, these .phr, .pin, and .psq files. Um, and so you do have to run a separate BLAST module to create those because these are the files that are going to be read by BLAST. BLAST won't actually read your FASTA file. It's going to read these indices. And so Bowtie is going to do the same thing. Um, we have to create indices that Bowtie can read to make your, to do this faster, right? It's a, it's whenever we make these indices, it's kind of a weird data transformation um, that makes identifying the source of a read faster. Um, and the old, the old school way was to just use BLAST, right? If you have a whole set of FASTQ files, you turn them into a FASTA, and then you map them back to the reference using BLAST. Um, however, BLAST can take a very long time to do that. And so there have been faster mappers that have developed since then, one being Bowtie. Um, Bowtie has a cousin called Bowtie2, that's pretty good. Um, but I, I kind of, my, my default mapper is most of the time BWA, whatever. So, I've already gone ahead and done these steps, so we can at least see how to run these commands and the, the inherent output. So, so I'm in my raw fastq file, um, I have my clean reads, and then I created a, a directory called ref. And so in ref is where I moved my reference ORFs to, right? That's, that's where my annotated ORFs are, right? Just so we can see it, um, right? So there's, there's the Trinity, name, the, the gene name, and then the sequence, right? Um, so that's there. But again, I have to create all of these additional files that RSIM and Bowtie can use. And so to create all of those files, that line is RSIM prepare reference. Um, by default, if I just run this command, it's gonna give me all, all the options for writing it. Um, but it really gives me like, very, very at the first, uh, the first line is going to tell me how to actually run this uh, program. So you run rsim prepare reference, um, you supply options, a reference FASTA file, and then a reference name. Traditionally, I keep my reference file, my reference FASTA file, and my reference name the same. Um, it, it seems to be a little bit faster 
or better for downstream analyses. Um, at least I don't have to create new names. That, uh, I think that's the main point. So if I'm running this for real, rsim prepare reference, uh, I guess let me find that one option in here. One option that's kind of important. Let's see if I can find, nope, 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 nope. Nope, okay. Bowtie. So Bowtie is already installed. It's in our path. We don't have to worry about it. Um, but if we, our reference isn't Bowtie um, indexed. And so we can just make rsim do that for us by running, by including this bowtie option. Um, so again, I, I've already run this, so it's just rsim prepare dash dash bowtie. So my face doesn't cut anything off. Um, and then the reference sequence, so so the reference fast to file. And then again, I'm just going to call that that name again. So reference dot fast again, right? And so then I will hit enter and just kind of wait. Now I, I I let this run this morning. Um, I it shouldn't take more than 10 or 20 minutes, but nonetheless it it, it would be best to run this in a you know Tmux terminal um, to avoid any hiccups. But that's going to create all the additional reference files that we see here, right? Um, all of these EBT, uh, EBWTs, these are specific for Bowtie. Um, and everything else, a lot of these other things are going to be specific for RSIM. But yeah, any, any of the EBWTs are going to be specific for Bowtie. Nonetheless. All right, so that's the first step, right? We have to create the indices. Uh, but once the indices are created, we don't have to create the indices ever again. They're, they're ready. Uh, we just have to point, we'll just have to point rsim to these index files uh, when we actually map. That's all we have to do from this point on. When the reference, when the indices are made, they're done. Okay. And so again, I've already run this program already and we'll look at the output for a second um, but whenever we run the actual rsim reference or what the mapper um, it's going to be rsim calculate expression right so there's really no just rsim program it's a, it's a whole bunch of scripts and modules um, that more or less are wrappers um, Right, so so rsim doesn't map. It's going to use bowtie to map, um, but then rsim will count. That that's the thing. rsim will count. Um, and so this this is the main command is R, rsim calculate expression. Now there certainly are more modules than what I'm talking about in rsim, but not going to worry about. It. So let's see this command. Yeah, um, isn't that bad? It looks a little weird, but I promise it's not all that bad. Yeah, so we ha we do have to tell rsim to be paired end. Uh, so so I moved the I moved the raw reference or FASTA to that ref directory, and then I ran rsim uh, uh, prepare reference, right? That, that was my path line. Like I, I moved it first and then ran um, rsim prepare reference. Um, R, yeah, yeah, rsim calculate stuff. Um, so we do have to note to note that our libraries are paired in. That's that's a re, that's a required option. Um, but then we supply the upstream reads and then the downstream reads. So this is going to be like file one, file two, 
and then we have to supply the path to our references, like the path to the reference file, uh, the reference CDS library. Um, and th that's really about all we have to do. Now we can supply a couple additional options to make it go a little bit faster and keep our output small. Um, clear. And so, as I said, I've already run this in a team up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna attach to that real quick. Okay. Right. And so, so if I'm here, so I have my reference and indices hanging out in ref. Um, I have my reads hanging out where I can easily see them. Right, I'm, I'm not doing anything with the Trinity Outdoor anymore, um, and I'll, I'll talk about what's in temp in a second. Right, I've just moved stuff around a little bit to keep things a little bit cleaner, but no less. So, uh, my my line here is RSIM calculated expression um, with a paired in option. Right, some, some this gets a little bit weird, but like dash dash paired in is required. Uh, for this option, but only a dash P is required for the number of processors. So in this case, I'm only using six processors for, for Bowtie and Arson. Um, but I can supply the, the, param the, the number of processors I want with the dash P option. And then I have this other option that's no BAM output. Um, I'm not going to talk about a BAM file in this class. It, it's, it's just, it's a very big file. It's ultimately what's going to be produced whenever we map reads. Um, but I'm not going to do anything else with that BAM file. I just want the read count. I don't want the BAM file because the BAM file is big. It's going to basically be the sum of the two FASTQ files. Um, so this will be another two gigabytes of space that I don't want to keep. So, so I'm going to get rid of the BAM file. By default, we're, it's going to release and give me back the BAM file. But I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with it. Um, we don't, it's not that important that we don't deal with it in this class. Um, so yeah, I'm going to supply this option to not, not return the BAM file. Whenever it's made, just delete it. And then I supply the reads, clean one, clean two, and then the reference. Um, I supply where that reference is. And then I have to give a output name. So RSIM is going to create a couple of output files besides the BAM file. And they're all going to start with whatever I supply here. Um, in this case, I have testis train X, XP. Um, whenever you, you do yours, right, um, for your livers, your output that I want you to use, um, use your... Um, your user ID. So for example, uh, jgoody underscore, um, and then whatever your library describes. It might be 15 PSU, um, it might be zero or pure water, something like that. So if you have uh, if you have a PSU library, if, if you have that library, use 15 PSU. Otherwise do like um, uh, uh, just water. Okay, so those are the two options. Just supply your username and then the the um, what your library came from, 15 PSU or just water. Um, we don't need any more information than that. Again, all the output files are just going to come with that prefix. Um, we don't need both. Just pick whatever is most relevant to your library. Um, but yeah, yes. Um, so again, I've already run this. Um, I'm not going to run it again uh, because this step will take a while. Uh, mapping reads and estimating expression, probably an hour, hour to an hour and a half. So I'm not going to run this one, but I've already run it and we can at least look at the output. Eh, eh. So I have moved that output. So whenever you, whenever this stuff is actually done running, what you should see are going to be two output files. And so I'm, I, I move those over to temp. So they're going to be generated from wherever you run this command line from. But I've just moved them, right? Um, 
And so you should see, I guess, really three output files. Um, but they're all going to start with whatever um, output prefix that you produce. In my case, it was test as train expression. And so I have a gene results file, I have an isoform results file, and then I have a dot stat file or a folder. Um, the only one that's relevant that I really care about is going to be the gene results file. This is the most important one. So we can we can take a look at what's in this file. And it's probably going to wrap. Yeah, it's going to wrap a little bit. Um, but ultimately, so this is a this is a tab delimited output file, right? It's not comma delimited. So we can at least look at the headers um, or the column names. So the first name is going to be the gene ID, right? And so that's going to be the gene or the transcript ID. But it's also going to provide a, a transcript ID. I, I, I'm not entirely sure why it does this, but this is a little bit redundant, right? Because it's going to be the same thing again, right? Same name twice, whatever. Um, and then we have the length. This is basically the length of the gene. Um, in this case, it's 789 bases. Um, but the effective length is like um, how many reads, or sorry, how much, how many bases had a read mapping to it. So in case the effective length, I think is 549, it's either that or the number of bases that could be mapped to, regardless. These two numbers, not so important. Um, the next three are more important um, because this is going to be, we have the expected count. Um, so that would be in this case, this number, that's the expected count. And this is the effectively the read count. This is approximately how many reads out of our library mapped to that specific gene. In this case, it's, it's 2,900. Okay, that's the raw read count. That's going to be the most important number in, in this in this file. But we have additional normalized read count uh, metrics because library sizes change, um, the size of a transcriptome varies, things like that. So if we have a library, say we have an RNA seq library that only has a thousand reads and 10 reads map to it. Fine. But if we have another library that has a million reads in it, and on the same gene, only 10 reads map to that again, well, the proportion of reads that map to that read are very different. Even though the same number map to, because the library size is so, was so different in that example, a thousand reads versus a million reads, that we also want to take into consideration the size of the library that we use. And so we have these additional um, additional metrics um, that are TPM and FPKM. And so these are kind of canonical expression metrics. Um, TPM is effectively uh, the transcripts per million. And so what, what this number is, the 711 is, is effectively saying, if we have a million transcripts, if we have an RNA, -C, if we have just looking at a cell and there are a million transcripts in that cell, how many came from that gene? Um, 700 out of a million came from that gene, right? So that, that's kind of what the TPM, transcripts per million. Um, that, that's a very, uh, that's kind of a favorite uh, metric for a lot of stuff I do. Uh, but the other is FPKM, and FPKM stands for like reads per kilobase million. Uh, it's a little bit different of a metric because it takes into account the size of each gene, right? So fragments is like the number of reads, fragments per kilobase, and kilobase is going to be each kilobase, like thousands of bases for each sequence, like our reference sequences. And then per million is going to be the size of the library. Right, how many reads actually map to this reference. So I don't use FPKM very often. Um, my, my two go-tos are expected count and TPM. Um, if I do like gene expression analyses across multiple species, I'm gonna use the TPM because it's a normalized count. It's effectively a percentage 
of the transcriptum came from which gene. So that's a little bit norm more normalized when I'm comparing across different species. But if I'm looking at within a species and say I, we have this kind of RNA-seq experiment that we're playing with, um, then I use the read count, the expected read count. Um, because we're going to normalize this. We're ultimately going to normalize our entire RNA-seq experiment. So we're going to have all of these reads, um, all of these read count values. And then next week, we're going to go back to R. Um, basically upload all those recount values and then normalize based off of the entire RNA-seq experiment. It's fancy, I can't explain it, um, but it's something we have to do and we do it with DE-seq. Nonetheless, I digress. Um, and so really, if we look at these transcripts or anything else, there is a little bit of variation um, in which transcripts are actually expressed, right? So we have three different transcripts that are all derived from the same gene with very different recounts. Um, so 996, 175, and 50. Ultimately, what I'm going to do is write a script to sum all these things together because I care about what the gene expression is. I don't really care about the individual, the individual transcript expression. Um, so I'm just gonna keep things a little simple and just sum up all the reads that mapped to say LFG1. And th that's all I'm gonna do with it. But yeah, so, so again, we can see some genes are more expressed than others. Um, right, so we can look at these, this transcript. This gets a little bit weird. I'm not gonna lie, this gets a little bit weird because this transcript was assembled by our library, right? We assembled this with Trinity from the reads in the clean library, um, but we have all these zeros. Basically means zero recount, therefore zero TPM and zero FPKM. Basically means zero reads mapped to that specific transcript even though Trinity assembled it. Um, and probably what's happening is just uh, there's a filtering protocol that um, RSIM goes through, right? It's, it's not going to count every single read. There's there's going to be criteria of what we call a mapped read or not. Um, so probably reads that would have mapped to this sequence and probably didn't meet some threshold or like um, one paired mapped but it's made to not, so we, we're not going to consider it. We're only going to consider transcripts that have both mates mapped. Right, something along those lines. But yeah, we'll definitely see that transcript um, abundance can vary pretty frequently. So yeah, that, that's going to be more or less um, for next week. So, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and do this right now. Um, so within data, if, if whenever you generate your gene results file, whenever this gets generated by, by you, um, hopefully try to get that done before Monday so we can, we can move forward in the next thing. Just generating this file really won't take all that long. It's two commands, um, maybe an, an hour, hour and a half of waiting. Um, but whenever you have those, um, make dir um, rsim output uh, f u. So whenever you make that rsim output file, um, you should be able to toss it into data data slash rsim output. So so leave it there, um, and then I'll, then I'll play with it over the weekend 
um, before Monday and generate a file that we can load into R. Um, so we'll bring that back over to our laptops, our desktops, and, and play with the expression calculation. And not just, not just expression calculation, but differential gene expression. Because that, that's a whole thing about RNA-seq is to one, figure out what genes are there. Um, and if we change the environment, how does the gene expression change? Right, so, so that's what we're gonna try to find out um, and, and sub uh, subsequent steps. So we have pure water livers and we have salt water lizards, uh, liver, livers, and we're gonna see if any genes change expression between those two environments. Um, so that's gonna be next week. Um, yeah, but you know, if you're having any problems with anything, if things are going slower than they should, you know, just, just send me an email, let me know. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's going to be it for today. Um, our same stuff. Arson prepare reference, arson calculate expression. Move the genes out file to data arson out, and, and that will be it. We're ready to move forward at that point. All right, um, so I'll see you all again, I guess, on, on, uh, on Monday. <laughs>